Good morning. Welcome to this Sunday service. I'm Jean Fukunaga from the business of the BWA uh, Associate. Uh, anyway, BWA. Okay. Uh, let's see. Okay, well, first it's going to be our group reading uh, The Three Treasures, one, page eight in your purple service book, or, uh, or displayed on the screen. Hard it is to be born into human life. Now we are living it. Difficult is it to hear the teachings of the Blessed One. Now we hear it. If we do not realize the truth in this life, when will it be realized? Let us reverently take refuge in the three treasures of the truth. I take refuge in the Buddha. May we absorb ourselves in the principle of the way to enlightenment and awaken in ourselves the supreme will. I take refuge in the Dharma, may be submerged in the depths of the doctrine and gain wisdom as deep as the ocean. I take refuge in the Sangha, may we live in harmony in the great assembly as disciples of Buddha and be freed from all hindrances, becoming units of true accord in the life of harmony, in the spirit of universal oneness, freed from the bondage of selfishness. Even through myriad ages of kalpa, it's hard it is to hear such an excellent, profound, and wonderful doctrine. Now we are able to hear and receive it. Let us thoroughly understand the true meaning of Tathagata's teaching. Namo Amitabha 2. Namo Amitabha 2. Namo Amitabha 2. Okay, uh, and the, um, okay, we're going to have the uh, sutra chanting, and then uh, it's on Juni Rai on page 67 in the Purple Service book.
Next, we'll have a Dharma talk by Reverend Henry Adams. Please join me in Gasho. Gasho Onegashimasu. Shakyamuni and Amida are our father and our mother, full of love and compassion for us, guiding us through various skillful means. They bring us to awaken the supreme Shinjin. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us and for uh, venturing out on this Beta Breakers <laughs> Sunday. It's, uh, it's, I was, uh, you know, I'd heard all sorts of, uh, you know, warnings from different folks about how difficult it was going to be uh, to travel through the city today. So I got an early start um, and I took the, uh, the, the special train that runs from Milbrae uh, to Embarcadero just for the runners uh, this morning. Uh, to, to get here uh, on time and so I got here nice and early um, and I'm really glad that all of you were able to make it here so we could be together uh, to uh, hear the teachings of the Buddha uh, this morning. Uh, the month of May uh, is a month for us when uh, we find ourselves reflecting a lot on the relationship between uh, children and parents um, as expressed in these words of Shinran Shonin that I read at the start of my talk. Um, this, of course, May, uh, we had uh, Mother's Day was last Sunday. Uh, we also observe our Gotane service when we uh, think about uh, Shinran Shonin's birth into this world. And of course, birth occurs uh, through you know, the existence of, uh, of parents. And then uh, also in just a few weeks, we'll have Father's Day. So this is a time when you know, we find ourselves thinking about our parents uh, and our families and you know, reflecting on the truth uh, of the Buddha's teachings that we can find the uh, relationships of love and support, of course, from the parents uh, who uh, bring us into this world, our biological parents, but also through many uh, individuals and people in our lives who can guide us and care for us with the nurturing uh, love of a mother, the love of a father. Um, and so this sort of goes beyond the Buddha's wisdom. It goes beyond our uh, kind of conventional ideas of you know, uh, what a mother is, what a father is, uh, and so forth. So I want to share some reflections on this truth and how this was expressed both in Shinran Shonin's life and then also the ways in which we can encounter this truth in our own lives uh, at this time. So uh, Shinran Shonin, uh, the founder of our Buddhist tradition, uh, this name Shinran was not uh, his given name, it was not, you know, as he was running around playing as a child, his parents were like, hey, Shindon, come in, time for dinner. Uh, he had a name uh, as a child that was um, Matsu Wakamaru. Matsu Wakamaru. And uh, that was his, his given name. And so when he was, and he, he kept that name and lived with that name until he was nine years old. So as a nine-year-old child, his life changed dramatically because it was at that time that he uh, ceased to live with his family, with his parents, and he entered into the Buddhist life. He did what is called leaving home and entered into uh, the life of a, a Buddhist monk, a Buddhist priest. And so why is it that at such a young age he entered into this life dedicated to Buddhist practice? 
uh, at the time that Shinran Shonin lived, uh, like in our own time, there was uh, a lot of conflict and uncertainty in the world, and there was a great battle taking place between two clans, the Minamoto and the Taira. These two powerful clans were battle battling for control of Japan, and they were, uh, you know, they would devastate whole cities, uh, whole uh, villages, vast swaths of farmland would be burned down through the wars and the battles they're fighting. And we see that, of course, happening, uh, sadly, uh, in our world uh, today as well. And so it was a time of great uncertainty. And at the time that Shinran Shonin was born, the uh, Taira family had the upper hand. And so you know, th those things, they often change back and forth. Later in Shinran's life, the other clan, the Minamoto, rose to power, but in Shinran's time it was the Taira who had the upper hand, and it's said that Shinran's family was connected to this kind of this, this, uh, this weaker um, sort of embattled clan of the Minamotos, and so it was seen to be the safest option for the father and all of the sons to then go into the Buddhist life, to leave, leave uh, the everyday world of society and to uh, seek safety in the family of the Buddha. And so it's said that Shinran Shonin's uncle, when he was nine years old, he took him to a temple called Shodenin, and they met with the head priest there, a priest named Jien. And it said it was, you know, it was a, a great journey from their home in the Hino area of Kyoto to Shodenin, which at the time was on Mount Hiei. And when they arrived, it was already getting dark. And so they arrived and they greeted the head priest Jien, and they said, you know, we'd like, I, the uncle said, I'd like for my nephew he would like to join your temple and to be a priest. And this is our family's wish for him. And Jian, I mean, you can imagine, he's like getting ready to close up the temple for the day. Um, these two people show up. This man shows up with his nephew. The end of the day, this nine-year-old child, and says, will you take this child as a disciple? This is a major responsibility for Jian because once Shinran leaves his family, then Jian is taking responsibility as his guardian. It's like if somebody showed up at your house, you know, just as you're about ready to get ready for bed, and says, oh, will you adopt this child, please? Right? That's the level of responsibility that Jian was being asked to take on. And so Jian says, you know, let's, let's sleep on it. Come back tomorrow, and we can discuss this further. And it's said that as they're talking and having this conversation, uh, Shinran Shonin then goes to the side and he takes a piece of paper and on the spot, he composes a poem that expresses his feeling. This was a common practice in those days. Uh, even, you know, in Shinran growing up in this uh, family of letters, he knew that, okay, this is a way we express our feelings. We write a poem. And so he wrote this poem and I'd like to, to share it with you today. Um, I'll read it first in English translation and then um, the Japanese original as well. Um, Shinran writes, For him who counts on tomorrow like the fragile cherry blossom, tonight unexpected winds may blow. For him who counts on tomorrow like the fragile cherry blossom, tonight unexpected winds may blow. Asu ari to omo kokoro no adazakura, yoa ni arashi ga fuka no mono kawa to nanmanobutsu. So, uh, Jian, when he heard this poem, he was struck by the, the uh, import of the moment and how much this child understood about life and where his life was right then. You know, he had the clarity of mind to see that I live in this world of impermanence. Now I'm being separated from my parents, just nine years old. I'm going into this new life. But he had the wisdom to see that impermanence, this is the nature of this world. We see this in the cherry blossom trees, which blossom. Last month we had our cherry blossom festival here. Those blossoms are gone now, right? So these things change in an instant, moment to moment, in our lives. And Jian hearing this, then he recognizes this child is seeking a place of refuge. 
He's no longer able to stay with his family, and he's seeking refuge here in the Dharma. He's finding his new family here in the family of the Sangha, those who follow the teachings of the Buddha. We sometimes say the Buddha's children, all of us Buddha's children uh, who receive the kindness and compassion of the Buddha. As Shinran says, Shakyamuni and Amida, our mother and our father, whose teachings are the guide down through generations. And so Jian then realizes that this child is ready. This child needs to come into this Sangha. This is the place where this now will be his home. And so Jian welcomes young Matsu Wakamaro into the Sangha and he becomes a priest. And then he takes, he, he, he comes on, he becomes a priest and he joins this, this Buddhist community. And he takes a new name, Hannen. Hannen. Now I won't go through all of Shinran's names because there are many, but we know him now for us as Shinran. And Shinran in this family of the Sangha, he found what I think we all find in our relationship with those who play that role of mother and father in our lives, whether it's our biological parents, another relative, a coach, a coworker, a mentor, uh, someone in some capacity of our life who shares with us wisdom and compassion. So wisdom in the Buddhist sense is the light that shows us who we truly are. If you think about those people in your life, they help you to see, see yourself and often to see your error, the errors of your ways. Times when you're being selfish, when you're being, in Japanese we say, waga mama, thinking about only your own priorities, your own values, your own way of looking at the world and to show you that's not correct. I think you could perhaps call to mind someone who shared that wise lesson with you. So sometimes, you know, we're feeling really kind of full of ourselves, and we need to be shown the truth that our way of behaving is causing harm for others. Other times we're sad and feeling uh, disappointed, discouraged, and we need someone to, 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 to sort of hold us up, to bring us uh, a sense of comfort and confidence, knowing that we are embraced by wisdom, but we are cared for in compassion. Times when we're feeling down, that loving parent also can be there with us. Maybe they can't completely solve the problem, but they can help us to see the path forward. And that's the life of compassion. Shinran Shonin encountered that in the Sangha, and we see that come through in his teachings, his reverence for Amida Buddha. So we see this in the life of Shinran Shonin, but we also see this in our own lives. Uh, for me, the first time that I lived separated from my parents was when I was in high school. I was a youth exchange student. I spent one year uh, in India, living in the South Indian city of Chennai. Um, I never, never really lived away from home except for a few days at a summer camp or something like that up to that point. But um, my parents supported me and encouraged me to go out on this adventure. Um, and not really knowing what I was getting into, uh, I went off uh, to live in India for a year. And I stayed with host families, families who then took on that role for a complete stranger, took on that role of mother and father. And if, as I look back on those experiences now, I see that they shared much wisdom and compassion with me. Um, you know, and this was, this was the days really kind of before the internet was widely available. At least I grew up in Minnesota. It was probably out here at that point. This was like 1995, 96. People in San Francisco were probably using the internet, but people in Buffalo, Minnesota were not <laughs> back then. And so, um, so you know, and I, I, I didn't have that regular communication and connection with my parents, with my mother and my father. And so the way that I would communicate with them was with one of these, right? A good old trusty Bic pen. And, you know, as I was preparing to leave for India, you know, I thought, okay, I'm going to want to write letters and stay in touch with my parents. So I went to Target and I bought a big box of these big pens. You know, it was maybe $3 or something back then. Big box, maybe, maybe 30 or 40 pens inside. 
and I also bought aerograms. Do you remember aerograms? They're those these blue single sheets of paper. You could write a letter on it, and then it would fold into its own envelope, and and then you could mail it. And they were you know very very inexpensive, and so I went. To, and they sold them all over the world. They had them here in the U.S., but I went and I bought some at the post office in India. And so I would write these aerograms. And I was, you know, I was separated from my parents, but also all of my friends. So I'd write lots and lots of these aerograms. I'd come home from school and I would write and I'd write and I'd write. And sure enough, before long, that first big pen I'd taken out of the box was all used up, all used up. And so I thought, okay, I've got. 29 more where that came from, just threw it in the garbage can, pulled out another pen, and kept on writing. Now, when I, the next day when I came home from school, I noticed that there were two pens sitting on my desk. And I was like, now I know I only had one pen. And so I thought, okay, that's weird. And so I picked up one of the pens, and I started writing, and it, it didn't write. And I thought, well, this, this pen is used up. Um, why is this here? Well, dropped it in the garbage, right? Got the other pen, kept writing, 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 and uh, next day came home from school, two pens were sitting on my desk. And I thought, this is so weird. Could it be? And I took my pen out and I started to write, and I said, oh, this pen is broken. And so I went then at that point to my host mother, who she told me to call her auntie. In uh, India, the custom is if you call people who are not your parents but kind of take care of you, you call them auntie and uncle. And so I would call her auntie and I said, Auntie, something strange is happening. I have this pen, but it doesn't work anymore. I keep throwing it away and then it appears on my desk the next day. And she said, Oh, you were throwing that away? Why were you throwing it away? I think probably, you know, the, the maid, the woman, that they had someone who cleaned their house, she probably thought it accidentally fell into the garbage can because why would you throw away a perfectly good pen? And I said, but auntie, look, it doesn't write. She said, oh, well, that's not a piece of garbage. This part, this part you throw away, but then you go buy another one of these. This part you can keep using. And I thought, huh? He says, let's go to the store. And so we went down to the store, and they weren't selling this part. They were only selling these at the store. Right? So their idea of consumption and what should be thrown away and what should be kept was much clearer, actually. They could see what needed to be reused and what really needed to be replaced. And so you know, that early on experience <coughs> really showed me uh, the way that I've been living growing up, you know, here in the United States where we just take things, we use them, we throw them away, we buy a new one without really thinking about what can be reused, what needs to be replaced. And that changed my thinking not only about big pens, but about many things and helped me to realize how much uh, abundance, and privilege and comfort I had grown up with and how that wasn't the case for everyone. And it was that little experience that kind of opened my whole way of thinking to really start to question, why have I lived so comfortably with such abundance that I can very comfortably just throw away a pen? Where for someone else, the pen is a precious item to be cared for and cherished. Right? A person who has so little that, for me, what is something that's just a piece of garbage for them is one of their prized possessions. And so this was the insight, the wisdom, that led me to rethink my whole <coughs> excuse me, way of living and to really begin to seek uh, the truth uh, of, that uh, would guide me in my life. And ultimately, I settled on um, the truth of the Dharma. But as I, was, as I was sort of searching and seeking and my heart and my mind were opened, I began to ask lots of questions to all of my friends and their parents and would ask them about different uh, teachers 
uh, different teachings. What do you all believe here? Uh, my host family were devout Hindus, very deeply spiritual followers of the Hindu religion. Um, but they would talk about the Buddha. They would revere the Buddha and say, one of the teachers of our tradition, because they identify the Buddha as, as a teacher in the Hindu tradition, say is the Buddha. They would share these words of the Buddha with me and I was sort of seeking all thing, all sort of things and every, you know, maybe once a week I would get on the phone and for 80 cents a minute I would go to a phone booth and call my parents because you could only make calls from certain international phone booths and I'd give them a call and I'd tell them very excited, you know, oh boy, you know, I'm learning all of these different new perspectives and you know, religion, and spirituality, and Hinduism, and the Buddha, and it's so wonderful. And my parents were overwhelmed. You know, their son is on the other side of the world. I'm an only child, and I'm telling them all about the Buddha, and Hinduism, and all this great stuff to me. And they're getting very, very nervous <laughs> about it because my parents have never met a Buddhist, right? They don't know, uh, just by virtue of the community where we grew up, they don't know people uh, of other religions and they've never heard of somebody who was raised a good Lutheran boy then going off and becoming a Hindu. And I could tell talking to my mother that she was, she was concerned because you know this, this uh, Christian faith is very important in our family and she could sense that I was kind of drifting away from that and she was getting very worried about it. And I could tell her concern. You know, I'm calling her up, I'm excited, I'm enthusiastic, and she's kind of sort of lukewarm about it. My dad too. And so, you know, here I'm all excited and I'm being met with this kind of mm, little bit of a cool reception. And so uh, when I came home, I remember, you know, I burst out of this phone booth. It's a hot, muggy day in South India. I walk home and, you know, it's just on my mind, like, you know, my parents, you know, are they okay with this? How, how are they feeling and just worrying and missing them and feeling concerned about, you know, will they accept all this growth that I'm experiencing here in India? And I remember going home and my host father is very much straight to the point. You know, we're sitting there at dinner and he says, Henry, I can tell something's bothering you. Tell me what it is. And I was like, uh, um, well, you know, uncle, um, you know, I, I just talked to my parents this afternoon and, um, you know, I can tell they're a little bit worried about me. Uh, and he says, are they worried that you're going to catch the plague? Because there has been an outbreak of bubonic plague here. And I says, no, no, no. They know that I'm, I'm healthy. He's like, oh, uh, have they seen images of all the people malnourished here in India? Do they think you're not getting enough to eat? And it says, no, uncle, no, they know that we live, you know, that you're taking very good care of me. I'm very comfortable and well nourished. He's like, well, if you're not sick and you're not hungry, what could be the problem? He says, well, my mom is worried that I'm going to become a Hindu. And my host father burst out laughing. <laughs> and I thought, hey, I kind of like the idea of becoming a Hindu. What's so funny? And he says, Henry, you can't become a Hindu. He says, what do you mean I can't become a Hindu? He says, Henry, you already are a Hindu. Anyone who seeks the truth is a Hindu. And I thought, wow, you know, it's not about what I call myself. Am I a Christian? Am I a Buddhist? Am I a Hindu? It's about seeking what is true for me. And in that moment, he showed me with great compassion that, you know, I don't need to go from one thing to something else and find some label to apply to myself, but I'm on the right path. Just continue to seek what is true. And that brought me great comfort. And I realized that, you know, I can just be, you know, myself and be open to these experiences I'm taking. And when I go home, um, my parents will be able to accept that. He said, you know, your parents love you. They care for you. So they don't need to worry about you. And when you go back, don't worry, they will accept you and welcome you home. And uh, that was really true uh, in my experience. And I was able to go home and return to be with them, you know, living in Minnesota. But also along that journey, I met many people who shared that wisdom and kindness of the parent with me. And it expanded my idea of, 
who can provide that wisdom and compassion in my life? And Shinran Shonin, he took great comfort in the presence of Shakyamuni Buddha, the wise teacher who came into this world of ours, who lived in India and taught the path to liberation from suffering. And Shakyamuni, among his teachings, he shared with us the message of Amida Buddha, the Buddha of great compassion for all beings. And Shinran Shonin reminds us that even when we're separated from our parents, they continue to be our guides, guiding us through skillful means, through ways in which we may not even realize at the time that we're being guided. And the Nembutsu is at work in our lives in that way. When we say these words, Namu Amidabutsu, we receive the Buddha's wisdom and compassion guiding us in ways we may not understand at the moment, but then as we move through life, if we just maintain this openness to our experience, to recognizing and gratefully receiving the kindness and support that are offered to us, then we find that as time goes on, we are able to settle into this great peace of mind that we feel when we are at home with our true parents, those who bring us that, that comfort whether it's our biological parents or some other person in our life with whom they show us the error of our ways, but also comfort us uh, in our times of difficulty. And the Buddha, in a really fundamental sense, does that moment to moment, each moment of our lives. And we hear that calling voice of the true parent of wisdom and compassion in these words, Namo Amidabutsu. So I'll conclude uh, my reflections uh, on this at this time, and I invite you to join me in gusho. Let us once again hear these words of Shinran Shonin. Shakyamuni and Amida are our father and our mother, full of love and compassion for us, guiding us through various skillful means. They bring us to awaken the supreme Shinjin. Namo Amida Butsu. Namo Amida Butsu, Namo Amida Butsu, Namam Dabuts, Namam Dabuts, Namam Dabuts, Namam Dabuts. Uh, thank you, Reverend Adams, for your in, informative uh, Dharma message. Our Gatha is going to be a special place, uh, and the music will be played by uh, Betty Fujimoto. Uh, it's located in the red binder on page 20.
have a closing meditative reading by uh, Yumi Hata Wong. Hello, everyone. Good morning. I'm going to share um, some writing by Reverend Dr. David Matsumoto on AAA life, AAA awareness, authenticity, and appreciation. Shin Buddhism is a path of living our lives with a growing and deepening awareness, deepening sense of awareness, authenticity, and appreciation. Shindan Shonin teaches us that as we continue to stay the Membutsu within our daily lives, we gradually hear it voicing the basic wish of life, that life may become itself and give itself freely to others so that we might live. As we walk the path of the Nembutsu, our ears open up little by little, and we begin to hear within our hearts the great sound of enlightenment reverberating throughout the universe. Little by little, our eyes begin to open, and we become aware of our actions, our thoughts, words, and deeds and their impact on ourselves and others. We begin to understand our connectedness with all other forms of being, and we begin to live our lives accordingly. Namwamita. Okay, I'd like to thank uh, Leo Balamba for doing the Khan show. Um, Sutra Chanting and Dharma Message by Reverend Henry Adams. Uh, Betty Fujimoto playing the music as we sang the uh, Galpa. And uh, Kevin Yosa for his uh, Zoom engineering. Uh, are there any uh, announcements? Okay, Kevin. Oh, uh, Nanayo. Good morning. Just wanted to remind everybody, hot dog luncheon next uh, Sunday after service in the gym. Please join us. Um, normally we do it following the Gotane service, but that was earlier this month. So we wanted to still try to do something to gather together and share some food. So please join us if you feel comfortable or if you're here. Thank you. Good morning. A um, uh, quick reminder, um, today's the May Board of Directors meeting. It's at 1 o'clock, so um, everyone's welcome to attend and participate. Um, it'll be here at the temple, or it'll also be on Zoom if you want to join us on Zoom. And uh, if you'd like the link, you can just email uh, one of the board members. Yeah, thank you. I know it seems a little early, but we are already planning for Bon Odori, July 24th. Um, it will be in person. And we're hoping you will all join us. Could you please help us? Um, we'd like to honor a few people. We're going to honor Mrs. Fujimoto, who's taught the dances for many years now. Reverend Abiko, who um, brought his spirit and enthusiasm in taiko drum making to Obon here. And um, we wanted to try to compile a list of all the previous and current Bon Odori teachers, for without them, we wouldn't have Bon Odori anymore. Um, so if you remember anybody or, or a lot of somebody's, please let us know. We'd like to make a list of all of those people and make sure that they get um, their appreciations. Thank you. Okay, next Sunday, our guest speaker is Juliet 
boss, I'm sure last spelling, but from the San Mateo Buddhist Temple. So I hope you can all make it. Uh, and uh, are there any other announcements? Uh, just to let you know, uh, after service, or oh, if you haven't, uh, Oshoku, you can you know go and do it after. Um, and then you can uh, go to the social hall and meet there because it's going to be open. But mask is still required. You can't eat uh, any food. But if you wanted to, you know, uh, meet in the social hall a little bit, you can after the service. And uh, this concludes this morning sangha service. Thank you for joining us. Please stay safe healthy and connected.